Can we avoid another financial crisis? I'm about to talk to economist Steve Keen. Subscribe for more conversations with great minds. Professor Steve Keen is with okay. us. It's, it's our conversation with great minds. He is the professor of economics. He's the author of Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? His website, Prof. Steve Keen, K E E N dot com, and his uh, Twitter handle, Prof. Steve Keen, uh, The New Gilded Age. Uh, Professor Keen, we, you know, it's been a while since we've talked, and, and you know, we've known each other for years, and, and I have always had such great respect for your insights into economics and how things are, and I appreciate your uh, staying up in London to, to, uh, to speak with us. Um, how, your newest book, How Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Let's start at the beginning. Why is it that financial crises happen? Well, the best answer that was given by Harman Minsky, uh, in a little phrase, which ends up being uh, summarized as stability is destabilizing. And his basic answer was that capitalism, in fact, I virtually quoted off by heart, I've read it so many times, uh, a capitalist economy is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crashes, and depressions. Uh, the reason is that the financial sector uh, generates signals that encourage a accelerated desire to invest and finance that investment as well. And therefore, you have a tendency to turn what he called doing well into a speculative boom, which he saw as the fundamental weakness of capitalism. And that's what we see time and time again. Yet, of course, the mainstream of economics tries to model the economy as if it tends towards equilibrium, and as the financial sector has no role, any, no more role, actually even less of a role than oil has in your car engine. And in fact, it's rather than being the oil or the lubricant, it's actually the fuel. So uh, that, <clears throat> that, was, that was pretty fast and, and, and a little didactic. <laughs> how, how would you explain that to a, uh, to a junior high school class? That's a good question, Tom. I'm sorry to be so technical. Uh, fundamentally, you have two sources of demand in a capitalist economy. One is the turnover of existing money. The other is new money created by credit. When you are an investor, a large part of investment is actually financed by borrowing money from the banks. And that generates additional demand and initial demand in the economy. It, uh, it also, of course, adds to the debt burden you face. Now, when you have, uh, if you have a period, if you had a crisis in the past, and there's always some crisis we remember, you and I might remember back to the 87 crisis um, yep. I'm sure the millennials listening now would remember back to the 2008 crisis. And given that background, up in recovery from the crisis, both banks and investors are very conservative about the amount of money they'll put into investment projects. So only very conservatively uh, estimated projects will get funded. And because the economy has recovered from the previous crisis, most of those projects succeed. And what happens is, quite naturally, both investors and bankers think, oh, we were too conservative. If we'd been more levered, we would have made more money. So you get an increase in the, in the degree of leverage people are willing to consider. You have a high level of credit-based demand financing investment. That sets off a boom. As the boom goes on for a while, what happens is capitalists who are borrowing money from bankers to finance their investment have to pay interest on the additional debt they've got. They also start pushing, pushing up demand in the economy, so workers finally get to the stage where they can get wage rises as well. The increase in the amount of money going to the, to the workers' as wages, and to bankers' as interest payments and raw materials producers as well, cuts off the profit that capitalists were expecting to get. They get less investment towards the peak of the boom because of that. They stop investing, the economy goes into a slump again. And that gives you an explanation for an up-and-down uh, cycle. I get it. What so pointed out as well. Yeah. So, the, so basically, yeah. it's the you know as business starts doing well, there's there you know or, or making larger and larger profits. There is a, a point in time when those profits they just can't steal all that profit. It basically starts slopping over into the workers and things, and and that then uh, creates a dynamic where the workers, the dividends, and the interest of the banks and things um, causes the businesses to slow down what they're doing. I, essentially, am I restating it correctly? Pretty well. It, it's, it's, fun. it's, it's, it's quite a, a simple, when you think about it, it's quite a simple argument talking about the desire to invest uh, in capitalists, which really drives the whole system, the need to borrow money to finance an investment when the level of investment you want to undertake exceeds retained earnings, and then the boom that sets off in the economy, which ultimately means that workers can finally get wage rises raw material prices go up, so raw material supplies 
get a higher amount as well. Capitalists therefore end up with less than they expected to get, pretty well it's much towards the peak of the boom. And at that point, the desire to invest declines, the economy slows down and you go into this repeating cycle. Now, the, 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 there's an alternative story about this, and that is that um, when the economy starts to heat up, um, a, a, in the case of the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, in the case of other countries, you know, similarly, the central bank will say, hey, wait a minute, this, this is heating up to the point where we're going to start having inflation, what Alan Greenspan used to refer to as wage inflation, which never seems to be applied to mm. CEOs. And therefore, we have to raise interest rates to slow down just in the, by the same mechanism as you're describing, to slow down the economy, to reduce that inflation. And then that, if it's, if it's excessive, if they go too far, that then tips the economy into recession, which is frankly what Donald Trump was suggesting a couple of, you know, a month or so ago. And it looks like uh, Jay, what's his name, you know, the, the, the new head of the Fed uh, <laughs> took, took his word on it and said, OK, we'll dial it back. Your thoughts on that? We've got a minute to the break, by the way, and we'll come back and we can continue the conversation. That's, reasonable. that's, that's like I'd call the, uh, that's the icing on the cake. Um, so, yes, in rising interest rates can, can slow the system down as well. And I think that will happen before 2020. But the cause that I'm talking about is a more fundamental cause. Even without variations in interest rate, I get a cycle out of this, and I get a cycle which leads to accumulating debt over time, and then finally a crisis like the Great Depression. So the interest rates is a secondary cause, but they can certainly cause trouble, particularly when people who control them don't understand the economy to begin with, and that includes the Federal Reserve. Shouldn't the Fed see this coming? I mean, when an economy is, he when a cycle is heading toward its peak, Shouldn't they, like, a year or two before that, put on the brakes a little bit to prevent it from hitting that point where the capitalists pull back? If they should, but if they understood the economy, they would. But they understand their model of the economy, and their model of the economy literally emits. What is the appropriate response to the tail end of an economic cycle, A, by the Fed, uh, or the equivalent central bank, and B, by average Americans or average, average working people, and C, by investors? Well, the response of the Federal Reserve should be, first of all, to rewrite their models. They include banks' debt and money properly, and therefore they can see these things coming because they're not in their models. That's why they're blindsided all the time. But when they do, what they should be looking at is, is the level of credit-based demand compared to demand from turnover of existing money. And when that gets to be too high, and it was seriously too high for the American economy uh, in between 2005 and 2007, uh, then they should cut back on credit-based demand before it accumulates too much debt, which, of course, is what they didn't do. Uh, for the public, if you're facing a fin if, if you've got fears about a approaching financial crisis, the only thing you can do is get out of debt. Sell any assets you have that are liquid that you don't need. Don't sell your family home if that's the only one you've got but get out of, uh, get out of levered, levered positions. And then that way you can, you can avoid the worst of the downturn. But of course, that sort of behavior by an individual uh, is a bit like an extra person jumping into a lifeboat. The lifeboat might sink. So we have to be, I think, to work at the macroeconomic level rather than uh, trying to get individuals to compensate their way out of the forthcoming crisis. I, it's been it's been said. Uh, I, I remember this rather vividly from back in the 1970s during the inflationary explosion. I, re, I subscribed to a newsletter by a guy named Howard Ruff. It was called the Rough Times, and um, he was kind of a right wing economist who was always talking about how wonderful gold was and stuff like that. But but he made a point. He said, you know, when you know that a crash is coming. There are two good positions to be in. One is to have no debt whatsoever and be completely in cash, and so that you can ride out the, the crash. In fact, the crash becomes a huge buying opportunity for, for every kind of asset from real estate to stocks. Or number two, to go all in for debt, borrow as much money as you possibly can, convert as much of it as you possibly can into physical assets that you might be able to hold on to, and plan to, de to declare bankruptcy at the peak of it. Now, that's, that's probably a crime to, to plan that out like that. But um, is there some truth to that perspective? I think it's how Donald Trump has made his money, by the looks of it. Yeah. Um, yes, indeed, if you can actually get to the stage where you pass on your, your debts, where you, where you make your creditors uh, wear the debts by paying back one cent in the dollar, in a downturn, which a number of Ponzi financiers have done over time, then that can be successful. But the, the, the respectable way to go about it is to be in cash 
when a crisis comes along because then the price of assets plunges. Right. And this is what people just don't get their heads around, that the assets can fall by a factor of you know, 20, 40, 50 percent during a crisis while people's liabilities remain constant. Yeah, had, had I bought into the stock market in a big way in 2008, uh, I, you know, I would be a very rich man right now. Or not, or not very rich, but you know, I would have done really well, mm -hmm. let's say, and and I think all of us would have. Um, uh, I didn't. A lot of people did. They were smarter than me. I, that's why I don't give investment advice. Um, the uh, these uh, typically seven to ten year cycles, uh, these uh, regular economic cycles in capitalism are really a function of how um, the relationship between the growth of the economy, the growth of the simultaneous growth of debt the desire of capitalists to get a return on their investment and at the peak of of that cycle their return on investment starts coming down and so their investment comes down and that brings about the downturn a if uh, correct me if i'm in fact stop me at any point if i get any of this wrong now b that's pretty good sir. okay yeah. b that the fed doesn't pay attention to the growing debt and doesn't have uh you know banks and things like that in their in their equations, which is why they always get blindsided by this, and see that um, you know if you if you think a recession is coming, uh, get out of debt because being in cash prevents you presents you with incredible buying opportunities, like happened in 2008, uh, if nothing else. Um, so there's all that. Where do you think that we are at right now in this economic cycle, and to what extent? was the the what many of us thought was going to be a recession this year short circuited by by uh, by Trump leaning on the Fed. Well, I've described the uh, global economy as having turned Japanese, if you remember the old song by the vapors, uh, because Japan was the first country to go into a debt crisis back in 1990. And it did that with uh, it had a peak level of private debt of 225 percent of GDP. And with that level of private debt, uh, first of all, it's a huge burden, a, re a repayment burden on those who owe the debt. And it also means people can't buy assets because it's too expensive to get onto the ground floor to begin with. So you have very low credit demand and the economy therefore stumbles along. Uh, very low levels of demand, very low levels of growth. And whenever the banks, the central bank believes that the economy is recovered and starts putting rates up, people start reducing their debt once more. That's been happening in Japan for 25 years, and over that period of time, debt has finally fallen from about 225% of GDP to 160%, uh, and there's a bit of a recovery going on at that level. Now, America's done the same thing, not quite as drastically. It hit 170% of GDP in 2009. It's now down to 150%. That is still a higher level of private debt than America had back during the Great Depression. So what you're going to have is very, very... Uh, weak demand, credit demand can easily evaporate if rates start rising, then people will start to delever and take demand out of the economy. So I don't see another crisis coming for America. Uh, I see a crisis for other countries. What I see in America's case is turning Japanese, having occasional recoveries that disappear uh, far too rapidly and people wonder why, and you bounce, bounce in and out of stagnation uh, potentially for one or two decades. Wow. Is this the consequence of, of new Fed policies? No, it's just a consequence of an ignoring level of private debt for that length of time. If you go back to the beginning of the post-war period, the level of private debt in America was roughly one-third of GDP. Now, because conventional economics says debt plays no role in the macro economy, they ignored it. Mm. They kept the data, but they ignored it. Now, in that time, private debt's gone from one-third of GDP to 170%, now they've increasing by a factor of five. Uh, if, you, if you ignore something that matters and it gets to be five times as big, uh, you've got a problem. And that's the situation America has got itself into, specifically because the economic profession does not understand the role of credit or debt in the macro economy. Remarkable. And if you want to learn all about it, you can read Professor Steve Keen's uh, numerous books. His most recent, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? His website, prof, P-R-O-F, as in Professor Steve, S-T-E-V-E, Keen, K-E-E-N.com. It's also his Twitter handle. Professor Keen, thank you so much for being with us today.